system. So let me bring him up. Okay, Brad, it's all yours. And Elliot, hit record. <laughs> I think I need to unmute you. Hold on a minute. Got it. There we go. All right. Uh, Anne Marie asked me last winter if I could do a demo, and I wasn't sure what I what I could do to this group with the expertise that everyone has. But um, I volunteered to do the one way system, and uh, I've been into coring bowls. Um, so this is a cherry piece that I got two weeks ago. Uh, it's 16 inches. And I'm going to demonstrate using the, the one way system to make multiple bowls. Now, I'll point out these, these are quite thick, but I, I generally like to do twice turn bowls. Uh, so I leave them thick so they have a lot of material to work with. Um, and we're going to turn the other half of this log. Another one that I did this weekend was an ash tree. Uh, quite an old ash tree that was outside the shipyard in Kittery and it was being taken down last week and I, I just uh, was driving by and asked if I could take a 20 inch chunk of it and uh, they graciously helped load it in the car um, and I was able to get uh, four bowls out of that that 20 incher um, and since it's ash I, I, uh, I generally don't turn once turned um, but I, I did it with this ash. Uh, I just haven't finished the, the larger 18 inch bowl yet. Um, but they're uh, gonna start their drying fairly soon. All right, so the, uh, the one-way system, I guess I'll, I'll back up a little background on me. I've been turning for four years. Uh, I started taking Marcel's class and uh, then after finishing that, I knew everything, and I came across a truckload of cherry, and I started making uh, cherry bowls uh, with a general salad bowl finish, um, and I was making bowls, quite a few, but I was standing in a foot of shavings doing it, and uh, I just got to thinking like how wasteful that was, and around the same time, the Granite State Wood Turners Symposium was happening. And the first demonstration I saw was Ron um, demonstrating the one-way system, and, and I said, I, I, gotta, I gotta get that. Um, so I, I, I bought one. Um, the system consists of the base, the knives that do the cutting, and a support finger. Uh, the base, you get um, for your lathe and the posts are determined by the height of your, um, of your headstock. Um, so this is set up for a 20 inch. Um, you've got a fixed post um, that you pivot the cutter on. And then you've got a adjustable post that is the support. And uh, it's gonna support the knife as you are plunging it into the bowl doing the cutting. Uh, it's a very well designed system. Um, the the knives and the support are uh, the right shape that they, they fit the curvature of the bowl. Uh, the limitation is that you're fixed to that curvature. Um, but I, I think the, the shape is good and, and uh, it's such an easy system to use. Um, one thing you do when you first get it, uh, you have to adjust that you're cutting at the center of the headstock. Um, so you adjust, there's a, a, a fastener on the bottom and you just set that for your set height and, um, and then you're, you're good to go. Um, so I got a, a quick funny story. I, I bought the system and uh, I had already purchased the, uh, the block, clamping block, that is specific to your lathe. And um, Packard, uh, was, their customer service was, was thoughtful enough to call the house the next day 
and uh, and they said uh, your system won't work without that clamping block. Um, and my wife answered the phone, and uh, when I got home from work, she uh, she asked me, "What are you doing buying a seven hundred dollar coring system?" Uh, so I explained. I, I grabbed the catalog and said, "Look, it's going to save save us money. It'll pay for itself and make less mess." So uh, I thought. It was a win-win. Um, I'm not sure if it's paid for itself yet, but uh, I sure do like having it. Um, while we're talking the uh, the equipment, so for an extra twenty something dollars, uh, it's good to buy the the knife sharpening uh, template. Uh, there's a jig to set on your grinder, set the right angle. I think it's a twenty degree that you let rest on the on the base. And then it comes with a fixture that holds the cutter itself. Um, and you have to sharpen three different angles, um, just the angles that they are, and then the face. Um, and you do that to keep them sharp. It cuts much nicer. I sharpen them almost every time, unless I'm using uh, the smaller nine inch. So yeah, I should explain. The knives come, there's four different sizes. They're numbered one through four. Uh, there's a 9 inch, an 11 inch, a 13 inch, and a 16 inch, which, which I did not purchase. So I've got the three. And tonight, I think we're only going to use the 9 and the 11. Uh, with those uh, dimensions, you do have an inch and a half of uh, adjust. You can adjust the base in or out um, to fit. Um, so uh, a 11 inch cutter, you can get up to about 12 and a half uh, if you need to. All right, get that out of the way. If there are any questions, comments along the way, I'd be glad to answer as I do the demo. Um, this is the, the cherry that I was able to get um, from a farm in Kittery and uh, it was very fortunate that uh, I was able to make contact with them and, and they were gracious enough to, to give me a piece uh, to use. Uh, for preparation, so it's half the log, uh, cut out the pith, um, you get both sides, um, I debarked it, made it round, made a hefty tenon on the base, um, and I did that about a week ago to prepare it um, for the coring process. Um, I was disappointed on this one. There is a, uh, a branch that went through here that I couldn't see from the outside, and it was, uh, it was soft. So the outer bowl uh, may, not, may not work out, but, uh, but it's really nice wood to, to core with nice and soft and green. Um, so good for this, this demonstration. Um, all right. About what's the diameter of that lock? This is 16 inch, uh, just over 16. So generally, it's best to start, since you have a, a sturdy tenon, uh, you start uh, coring out the smaller bowls first uh, and the, the largest bowl last. Um, what I've been doing is um, putting a 5 16 for the, the worm screw um, so that when I get the center out, I can flip it around, uh, redress the tenon. Uh, and then carve out the, the inside of the bowl. All right, so to do a little planning here, sort of have in mind the size that we're gonna do tonight. Um, I'm picturing 
about a nine inch. Something like that. And then I'm going to split the difference and do probably a, a 12 plus. So in the end, I'll have three bowls. The cutter thickness is three eighths of an inch. So you have to account for that. Uh, and I don't do smaller because I've got the uh, faceplate screws uh, that went in an inch plus. So um, it's difficult to get anything smaller. So the nine inch, uh, and then what do we got here? Um, just shy of 13 inch will be the medium. And uh, 16, almost 16 and a half will be the largest. So I've got the nine inch cutter. Gonna line that up and get it as close. I have with this blank, Plenty of depth, I'm not too worried, but one thing you have to keep in mind is how deep uh, you're cutting into. Uh, if I were doing this a live demo in, in Woodcraft, I, I would have used a faceplate most likely. And then I've got wor worry about screws. Um, being here, you're safe at home. And um, I haven't had one come off, but uh, I'm just relying on the tenon and I'll, I'll use the tailstock as well. So I have the fixed post uh, about an eighth of an inch off the piece. Um, that's because I, I want to get as deep as, as possible without, without touching. The support finger uh, is also about an eighth of an inch. Uh, when starting out, um, it's just supporting the end of the cutter. Um, and then you'll see we have to move it. Generally, I, I cut up until the the knife, there's this, this dropping point. Beyond that, uh, it's not supported as it's going in the wood. Um, and it may chatter, uh, could do nasty things. So you then use the, um, the knife support, get that in place, and that's going to support it uh, the rest of the way. I'll be adjusting as I go. Handle on. And the tailstock. So I, I have not bought a uh, Morse taper extension yet. And I've been using um, the cones that came with the one way live center just to get a little extra distance so the tailstock isn't fully extended. Yeah, the extensions are nice. I got one for mine. Uh -huh. um, the lathe is on its low uh, speed. Um, this is an old Powermatic, and uh, so it's the belt you adjust. It's got the low and the high. Um, zero to 1200 is, is the RPM. For coring like this, I'm, I'm generally four to 500. Um, I, I go by sound. Uh, I only have the the drive controller on the headstock. Uh, I don't have any digital readout, so I'm really just going by feel. And, and but I think that's on the order of four to five hundred RPM. So at this point, we're ready to start pouring. So when you're pouring, you just gradually put your brush down. And you can see just the 
come out. I, I obviously sharpened the cutting tool. We're in good condition at this point. But I don't know if you can see, I, I'm starting to get the, the down slope. So this is where I stop and I clear all the shavings. And I'm going to get the support finger in so it can do its job supporting the knife as it needs to cut more. Trent, just so you know, we lose your audio when you're cutting. Thank so you. you'll. <laughs> So the support is uh, only about an inch in, um, but that's going to support it as we're able to get deeper into the bowl. Uh, before I, I always check it to make sure the support is, is moving free and not binding. And we'll do a little more coring. So it's a, a pretty quick process. Um, this is great wood to be pouring. And one thing you're missing at home, it, it, the wood smells great. The cherry is really fragrant. The, the cutter and the, the support do get quite warm in, in coring. Um, so you wanna be careful um, with the heat. Hey, Tom, is yours a one way? Yes, mine's a one way. I'm sorry. The, um, the system's a one way. Was that the question? I think he was asking me if mine was a one-way. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> so we're going to work the knife in the support. This will be the last, it's as deep into the bowl as, as it'll go. So that'll support it the rest of the, till we get this first piece out of the bowl. So that's almost all the way through. Um, I generally try to pry it out before I, I get the cutter all the way in center. It leaves you more material to make a, a thicker tenon. And I take a pry bar and pop it. So now I've got my first nine inch blank out. So at this point, we're going to switch to a larger cutter. The next size, you got to take this handle off. By the way, the handle, when you buy the, the base, this handle comes with it and it fits all the knives. So you use one handle for all the cutters.
How long do you let the bowls dry when you're cutting wet? Um, so this time of year, my basement's rather dry. Um, I, I'll put them in uh, usually Trader Joe's bags. And, uh, and then for larger things that won't fit in the Trader Joe's, I put them in uh, leaf bags. And um, I'd say this time of year is three to four months minimum. And how do you make out as far as cracking is concerned? What do you think your, your ratio yeah. is? Yeah, I'd say probably 20%. Um, some, some get minor cracks and, and I can work around. Um, I, I do tend to round the edges. I know we've talked in the club before. Um, not sure scientifically why, but uh, rounding the edges um, seems to help from having sharp edges. Um, so I, I will round them and uh, but I have a stack of bowls from last season that I haven't gotten around to finishing. And I'd say there, there's only a, a couple that, that have cracks of significance. Do you do any kind of sealer on them? Um, generally, I don't. Um, I, I did uh, do the, the uh, wax emulsion um, just to hold this for the, for the demo. Um, but I'm gonna turn that wax away before I store it. Uh, the um, timber, I forget the name, timber, the, the wax emulsion that, that we got a, on the bulk buy. That's generally oh, what I need. Anchor seal. Anchor seal, sorry. All right, um, so I'm going to adjust the base out a little bit for this next four. Hey, I'd like to mention something. If you're using the same chuck all the time, you can make a spacer that'll get your cutter to go yay far from the jaws of the chuck. And that way you can just set it and make sure you're not gonna be cutting too deep. So on my lathe with my six inch jaws, with my one way, it's 14 inches to the edge of the vertical piece, the pivot piece, to the headstock. So I can, I can set it at 14 inches and know that I'm gonna be safe. There's no way I'm gonna come too deep in the bowl with my 16 inch, with my 16 inch um, knives. Um, so does I, that I, make sense? It does, thank you, Ron. Um, one thing I, I do, so uh, if I need to do some light turning, um, I, I have used the, uh, the tenon that comes from the cutter. Uh, it, it's a very small, it's only an eighth of an inch or so. Um, but if I needed to do some light turning to, um, to round the edges or, or um, some, some preparation for, for drying, um, I do use that on occasion. Um, but generally I'll, I'll either, um, Cold jaws uh, make the tenon larger, more more secure. Um, if I need to do any uh, get any material off the bowl, and you'll follow that one out before drying on the way. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Again, I'm a, I'm gonna try, man. I I'm full of I'm always stepping in, but I've ended up finding that PVA glue is basically regular school glue, Elmer's glue works marvelous as a coating thing. And as Jim was over the house last weekend, I have extremely good success with not getting checks and cracks. I coat the entire outside of the bowl and the end grain on the inside of the bowl. And it may take a little longer to dry, but I've had very, very, very good success. And I actually found a a place I can get it for five bucks a gallon. So, you know, but it's PVA glue, polyvinyl acetate or something like that. Regular, regular Elmer's glue works marvelous. And Ron, roughly how many months are you letting them dry? Um, well, I have a moisture meter and stuff, and you have to keep in mind my cellar is heated with a wood stove. So I actually did like 60 bowls last weekend, and I put them in this 
thing I have outside. I mean, no rush because I have so many bowls ahead of me. So depending on the weight, uh, on the size of the bowl, you know, it, it goes by, you know, how long it dries. I used to weigh them. I'll tell you one thing that I do that ha makes a big difference is I don't do a uniform wall thickness. I do thick at the rim and reduce the wall thickness as the diameter changes. So the bottom of my bowls are pretty much close to the finished thickness I'm going to have. And I've had very, very, very good success with that. Okay, I'm I'm a mute. Um, so one thing I do on this next bowl, I, I take off the point. Um, the point was in the um, where the worm screw will go on the first bowl that we, we took out. Um, but I don't want the point to damage uh, potential uh, the, the bowl that I want out of the next. So what I've been doing is uh, using the other cone that came with a one-way live center but reversing it this direction. So it's just putting pressure against, uh, and this is because I don't have the more taper extension. Um, this allows me to gain two or three inches. Uh, I would never turn without using the tailstock and just relying on the tenon. That, that to me is a, a bit too scary. So I always want something helping it stay in place. Um, I can go on this tailstock up to four and a half inches, um, kind of right at its limit with this one. That's four and three eighths. Uh, you, might ask uh, what this is on my tailstock. Um, I got this lathe cheap because it had fallen over in transport. Um, it's a 20 year old lathe, but the tailstock had cracked in falling over. And um, so it was on its way. Nobody wanted to repair it. And um, so I was able to get a, a welder in. And um, Powermatic, when I contacted them they said uh, they don't sell tailstocks off the shelf no one no one ever asked for a replacement tailstock so it was going to be like a thousand dollars to replace it and um, I was able to get a welder in for under hundred and fifty dollars who was able to do a good job and I haven't had any issues um, the first weld he did was not perfectly lined and he did have to grind it off um, but the second time it's it's spot on and it's worked really well So I've got the 11 inch cutter now, uh, the handle's on, the tailstock is set and secure. Uh, the support, I just have to tighten and then we'll start pouring again. Gonna check the chuck, nothing's moved. So we're ready to go. All right, I'm at that spot that I like to adjust the support finger.
the sound of turning demos is pretty bad. And, and this one, uh, the sound I'm sure is uh, not very pleasant either. But the wood smells great. IJ cancels out the noise. So it just goes silent. Oh, good. Not too bad. So it's getting every, every time you plunge it in, it gets a lot of material out. Uh, the cutters, uh, somebody was talking about earlier, the, the cutters do a really good job, uh, but they aren't cheap. The, um, the little cutter pieces are about $33 for steel. Uh, they do make a carbide, I haven't tried, um, but they are $50. Um, but I, I think I like, I haven't tried the carbide, but I think I stick with a steel because uh, I can sharpen them easily. And these have worked really well for me. Generally, if there's rubbing, I, I, uh, I try to adjust it so it moves freely. Um, it's just going to create heat. And, um, so if you can get it as, as balanced. Um, but if you have everything adjusted properly, you shouldn't have to do too much tweaking. It, some of it is just managing the dust so that you get a good fit on the base. This will be as deep in as the sport finger can go. Thank <laughs> you. 
First one we could easily pop it out. Um, this one's uh, uh, quite beefy. It's it's got a lot of material, but you do have to be careful that you don't put too much pressure on on either the inside or the outside. Um, you certainly don't want to crack either either one of those. So I've taken the taken the pressure off the tailstock, so this is free. And once you hear that snap, then uh, you know you're done coring. Get the tail socket out of the way. One of the tricks yep. someone said is make sure when you do that cracking that you, you're uh, prying against the side grain, not the end grain. Less likely to crack. And also, it, it, this tendril will split easier that way. Just get the base completely out of the way. Uh, yeah, my mistake, the sport finger is still in there, so that made it a little more difficult to Red, did you go as far as you could with the cutter? You know, I probably didn't. <clears throat> it was almost there, Ron. There it goes. All right, so there's the 12 inch blank. Brett, one thing I did on mine is on the outside of the cutter is I marked a line every inch. So that way I was adjusting every inch. It didn't help much because the wood I turn I do is um, semi dry, and I bent both my cutters. So, but I I was trying to take precautions. But you really really want to do green wood. Yes. Really want to do green wood. Yeah. So now, Drew, uh, that didn't take long at all. But I've got three. The good bowls uh, out of one chunk of wood. Um, again, they, they are thick. This one I will hollow out before I start the drying process. Um, generally, I, I do the thickness about 10% of the diameter. Um, that's the, the rule of thumb that I was taught. Um, the outer one is probably a little thicker, but I, I did that intentionally because of this defect. Um, so I'm going to try to uh take down the outside and um and salvage this one without without that character um so yeah i uh put these in paper bags um three or four months uh i check on them now and then i write the date on the bag and um usually the uh, street address where the wood came from and uh and then i wait once they're uh, done with the drying process, I, I, I don't have a meter, so I'm really going by touch and, and feel. Um, uh, then I will improve the tenon and, uh, and then finish it. Um, and the last is uh, cold jaws um, or a, a donut and um, to remove the tenon in the end. Um, so I've been doing this a couple years now and then love the hobby and, and having uh, amazing gifts that I can bring to 
people's homes and, and leave behind. Um, yeah, so that, that was pretty much the extent of my, the coring that I was intending to show. Um, curious from the audience, I, I imagine there are a lot of cores, but uh, I did this for those that uh, might not have been exposed. Um, it was the uh, symposium, like I said, that uh, I saw it and um, then I just said it's a, a tool that I need to have. Um, and uh, it's great to be able to get all the extra material and, and not have it waste. I was uh, mulching the, the, the flower beds and, and walkways around the house uh, with shavings and, and now I have less of that, which is a good thing. I, so, great nice job. job. Hey, Brett, something that you could, you can get a, a digital scale for very cheap money. And when I first started, I was kind of in a rush. I was weighing my bowls. Now that I've got so many ahead of me, it, it doesn't make any difference. But to, to make sure you draw, you can do uh, weighing. And that works out really well. When it stops losing weight, you're at your equilibrium. The thing is that if, if you're not dry enough, they will distort. Even though you think they're dry, they, they definitely will, will distort. Then you just say it's a once turn. So, uh, yeah, I, I did have um, a little while ago, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was turning this bowl. And um, I think I, I did make the base too thick because there is a a crack that formed and, and finished turning it um, that wasn't there initially. There's nothing I could see, but it was uh, when I was just finishing um, the inside, it does go through very slightly. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still experimenting. Um, and I, I was also here is uh, I was given a laser engraver. So I'm playing around with how to mark the bowls that I finish uh, a, a new new tool. So, Brett, I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest this again, and give this a try. And this was something I got from Alan Lacer at the at the last symposia, was that the ten percent is relative to the diameter of the bowl at its diameter. So basically, if you have an eighteen inch bowl, you're inch and a half. As the bowl reduces diameter, your wall thickness can reduce. You're, you're following me? And I've had very, very, very good luck with that premise. I still get cracking cracks, but you. much better yield than when I first started, of like 20% yield. <laughs> now, so. Brett, a couple of suggestions. I also have a one way coring system. In fact, my lathe that I have was first used when it came brand new from One Way by David Lancaster, who was the guy who did the video for the One Way system when they marketed it. I don't know if you got a video with yours. Yeah. When, you yours. when One Way was selling them direct, they sold it with a DVD, uh, and David Lancaster was the demonstrator. He's the first one who used my lathe and put the first coffee stain on my waist. But what, one of the things that you might be uh, might be helpful uh, before you take the lathe out of the chuck would be to put a center point at both the bottom uh, and the inside. Uh, mark that bottom either with a bit of ink or uh, some kind of a point so you can make sure you can exactly find it when you come back to re your secondary turning. That's a good trick. Yeah, thank you for that. Brett, you mentioned in the very beginning that you cannot change the angle and therefore cannot change the shape of the bowls. Is that actually true? Or well, if you adjust the position of that cutter, can you angle that bowl and make it wider and therefore flatter? You can some. You, you, this, this curvature is fixed. You can change its position uh, in or out, um, but then your subsequent bowls are, are not going to be the same thickness. They're, they're going to vary. So you have to keep in mind that you might be thinner in spots than others. Um, but 
you, you do have some flexibility um, a little by adjusting the, the base. You're still gonna get the same curvature though, whether you're out or in, just it'll be either real shallow or, or you know, or steeper. The radius yep. is fixed uh, by the cutter. Yep. Well, if you're going with a thicker wall thickness, like your outer bowl there, you can change, you, and like you're, you're intending to do with that um, inclusion you have, you can change that shape somewhat. I mean, I have on a, on a couple of the corings I've done. So if you did three thick bowls, you can change the shape of them a little bit, not a lot, but a little oh, bit. When you, when you second turn them, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. And then when and the first coring I did, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, that's generally what I liked because uh, I don't, can't always envision how the bowls are going to turn out. So having a lot of material, um, I can play around and change the, the finish shape, um, right. make, make it shallower, make it deeper. Um, yeah, having that material help, helps for that. Nice. Sorry, did you have more? You were, I what got you off. Uh, the first time I cored was um, I used my worm drive, a screwdriver to, to to turn my tenon, turn it first shape. Then I cut my biggest bowl first using my live center to support it. Cut the biggest bowl first and then <clears throat> took that big chunk out of the middle, set that aside, uh, smoothed the inside of the, the big bowl took it off the lathe, put it back on the worm drive, turned another foot on it, and it probably the wrong way to do it, but I tend to do things a little differently. So, uh, and I liked doing that, but not necessarily, necessarily the right way to do it. But I found I had better support. And I also made a jig that goes inside my tool cutter so that I can see how deep I'm cutting into that bowl. Because I tried doing the math and it didn't work so well the first time. So I, I got frustrated and um, I made a jig that the tool rest can set into and I can put it over the top of the bowl that I'm working on. Okay. Brett? Yeah, I have tried using the um, support finger as a tool rest to um, try to clean out the inside and, and um, it, it does wander and, and move around a little bit. Um, trying to clean up some of this stuff before yeah. I put them in a dry. Um, yeah, having a, a jig or, or something would, would be nice. Hey, Brett, uh, David Lancaster did a presentation at Pinkerton down the, in the wood shop at Pinkerton, and he did a huge red ash burl bowl. And uh, he did the biggest one first. He said, that's the money bowl. That's the one you're going to get the most money for. And you want to protect that by doing it first. And if you get more wood out of the center, that's fine. That's extra money for you. To take care of the big money bowl first. That was his philosophy, which is different than yours. And I, I think yours is a much simpler approach than uh, Lancaster's was. It's less, less steps to uh, moving in and out of the chuck. But that was he was he was always protective of the money bowl. <laughs> well, d doing these small bowls first is more efficient because technically you can go go go. Uh, if you do the largest corn first, then you have to go and set a tenon on it and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, it teaches on, but I, I always core the small to the larger. And, you know, if I miss, I miss. But um, <laughs> from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, um, you know. So if you, if you were to drill and tap a hole, in the support arm base, you could the support arm base, the finger, yeah. you could lock that in position, drill and tap from the side, you could lock that in position and use it as a tool rest. Okay, where it doesn't move around. Sure. Okay. You know, it's not a big deal. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you didn't want to take everything off, you could do it that way. It would it would work. Yeah. Do you do that on yours? No. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I bent 
my 16 inch and 13 inch cutters and fingers twice. Um, so I'm going to be, I, I talked about this with Bill before the meeting. I'm going to be modifying mine so that way the support is built onto it. It's, it's kind of a, I, I, I dick around. So, you know, when, when I get done, I'm not going to have a finger because it's going to be built onto the thing, but I actually use a, um, a knockoff of a McNaughton. So you're and also a, turning about a thousand RPMs wrong. I'm well. I also use a steady rest. I'm using. I have jaws that are, I have two to six inch jaws, two to seven inch jaws, and I normally, if I'm doing coring, I'm using my six inch jaws. Okay, and then I also have a huge steady rest because the majority of the wood that I work with is partially dry. I, I don't get ribbons. I do not get ribbons. A Mack truck. I don't think Sidney Drosser would fit in his shop because he drives I'm, like a Mack truck. Well, <laughs> I'm I'm maybe I'm maybe a little more aggressive. Yeah, I, I my things come off they're, they're dust. Okay, so and ash when it's hot when it's dry, it's some tough wood, and I had so much ash that you know. It kind of sucked because I, I bought the two sets of knives, made the base thing, but the very first bowls I would do, and I was only going an inch, an inch a piece, inch every time. But you get a damn catch, and boom, you know? So. Ron, I've, I've always wondered what happens in a, a catastrophic uh, bending a knife. Does it just stop the machine or, or well, something worse? Well, it, it, it can stop. Stop the machine. It can throw your bowl. Um, you know, Birch, I have a lot of wood that is kind of spalted. So the tenon might not be as strong as it should be. That's why I use a steady rest. Yeah. And it'll stop. You'll ruin the belt on your lathe. Um, Eastern Bearing knows me pretty well because I've gone in to buy belts and, and whatever, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I may be a little more aggressive than I should be, but you know, it's three, it's three horsepower. It should do it, you know. <laughs> so next month, Ronald does it demonstrate what not to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you can do green wood, it's it's a piece of cake. Okay, the the greener the better. Ron, when I do coring, I make sure I don't tighten my belt too tight. I let that become my emergency switch by letting that belt still slip just a little bit. I don't mean that loose, but I just don't tighten it overly tight so that there's a, a chance for it to slip. I ran into a, a, a hidden knot in a large bowl like Brett has in front of him. And uh, it, it bent one of my big cutters, but I was saved from a catastrophic damage by the belt slipping. Hmm, great idea. Yeah, I, I actually caught metal in one, and you know whatever it. Uh, green green wood is the key for coring. That and power. Okay, if you if you've got a one horse lathe, you're gonna have a hard time coring. You know. Yeah, mine's a horse and a half, and my I can I have to be really careful going through. Yeah, we. Um, I got a lathe, a Delta. Four, uh, what was it, 1442 for the Manchester Makerspace, and we threw a one-half horse motor with a VFD on it, and I actually brought in my coring to test it, and it did it, you know. But with my three-horse motor, um, again, I you have this huge steel um, steady rest. And with that, you know, and if the wood's green, I don't even need the steady rest. But from almost all the coring I do, I use the, if it's a over 15 inch bowl, I'll use the steady rest just to, just to guarantee that's not going to catch and throw it, you know. But, you know, as it's, it is what it is, you know. Brett, can you show a little bit what you would do? when you come back to, to, to return those bowls? 
I may take this, the middle one and show just show what you would, how you would approach it. Yeah, so Tom, I, here's one out of the other half of the, the log, um, the medium size one. It's got the, um, just the material that was left from the cutter. Um, I generally would put on coal jaws with my other chuck uh, and make this uh, three eighths of an inch instead of the, the eighth of an inch that it is, um, or maybe a quarter inch. Um, just make it more solid, secure, and then flip it around. Um, and work the outside first, then the inside, um, do my sanding, uh, and then lastly, uh, flip it over and take the rest of the tenon off. Okay. So that, that's the general process that I do. Um, and I've been using two different finishes from um, the walnut oil to um, general finish, solid bowl finish, depending on how I intend the, the bowl to be used. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, but, so after I took, uh, when, when I first got into woodworking, this was one of the first bowls that I, I made. Uh, it's now three years old. And um, yeah, we use this, this is our salad bowl that we use pretty much every night. Um, and I just, it, it holds up and it's a great piece. Um, so I, I like to make those and then um, give them away or sell them to people that I know. What's the finish on that one? This is the general finishes, um, three or four coats, um, but it's been in use in the family for three years now um, and it's okay. holding up really well. Yep. That's great. Anybody else have any other questions? Comments? No, great job, Brett. Thank you very much, Brett. Did a nice job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, no so guess, glad, glad to do it. Thank you. Yeah, so, nice job. So if anyone else feels